So uh, turn Bibles again, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 to 6. Are you there? All right, Matthew chapter 7, beginning verse 1. Do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to dogs. Do not, throw what it, do not throw your pearls before swine, or they will trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we pray today that you might open our minds, that you might open our hearts, that you might open our understanding to what you've taught us in your word. We pray it in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. If I were to do a survey this morning and ask you to write down what you think the world's most popular scripture is, I have a feeling that John 3.16 would probably come in number one or number two. The 23rd Psalm might come in number one or number, tw or number two. Romans 8.28 would probably be in there in some people's ballots. And 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, would be in others, but... Whichever one of those rose to the top and got the most votes for the world's most popular scripture, you would be wrong. I would submit to you that those are perhaps the church's most popular scriptures. But I'm speaking today about the world's most popular scripture. And by the world, I mean the unsaved world. I mean the world that's under the sway of the evil one. And when you think about the world in that regard... Without any doubt in my mind, the favorite scripture of the world is Matthew 7.1. Always, it seems, quoted in good King James English, judge not, lest you be judged. In our day, it's the most frequently memorized, widely quoted, and least understood verse in the Bible. Anytime a Christian dares to quote the Bible in defense of a moral position, you can be assured that the other side will quickly respond with, Judge not, lest you be judged. It's proved to be a useful dodge. A quick way to shut up the Christian without having to engage his arguments because unfortunately, most Christians don't understand it either. And the crazy thing is, by quoting that verse at the Christian to accuse him of being judgmental, how exactly is that different from the Christian quoting the Bible in defense of his moral stance? The judge not crowd is in fact judging the Christian for judging. And those who so blithely throw out that passage of scripture clearly do not live by their stated interpretation that it forbids all judging. If their spouse committed adultery, do you think they would say, oh, that's okay, dear, because after all, judge not, lest you be judged. If their house was burglarized, do you think they'd tell the police officer, oh, officer, don't worry about catching the culprit because in our house we live by judge not, lest you be judged. If somebody harmed their child in some way, do you think they'd just shrug it off and say, judge not, lest you be judged? Of course not. In all of those cases and hundreds more like them, they would make the judgment that what was done was wrong. So it's not that they're against judging per se, they're against certain judgments that they don't like. They're against certain judgments that they disagree with. They're against certain judgments usually about sin that they themselves are either neck deep in or else that they're defending in somebody else's life. Many would have us believe that Jesus taught us to turn off all critical thinking skills and never make moral judgments of any kind. Not about right or wrong, not about good or evil, not about sin and righteousness, not about true and false. But that teaching is far more in line with the, with the teaching of our society than with the teachings of our Savior. See, a society without values will tolerate anything except, the, except those who won't tolerate everything. Let me say that again. 
A society without values will tolerate anything except those who won't tolerate everything. Those pesky Christians who insist that some things are always right and some things are always wrong. Did Jesus forbid us to make moral judgments? Did he command us to uphold all decisions as equally moral and right? Did he teach us that we should never point out sin? Of course not. Taken in isolation, verse 1 would seem to teach that. But notice that in verse 6 he says, Do not give what is holy to dogs and do not throw your pearls before swine. I would suggest to you that that requires a certain level of judgment as to the swinishness or doggishness of those you're preaching to. Take it in a larger context of Jesus' teachings. Jesus actually elsewhere in John 7, 24 commands us to judge when he says judge with righteous judgment. Throughout scripture we see biblical commands to judge, to expose evildoers and false teachers, to confront sin, to discern spirits, to test prophecies, and even to judge ourselves during the Lord's Supper. So what was Jesus saying here? Clearly he was not saying that we're to suspend all judgment. What Jesus is forbidding here is what we might call judgmentalism a critical, fault-finding, abusive spirit that heaps condemnation heartily and heavily upon others. And I think the easiest way to understand the difference between the two, proper judgment and improper judgment, judgment that is in line with God's Word and judgmentalism that is it not, I think the easiest way to understand that those two is by looking at a series of contrasts. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Notice, first of all, this one's huge. Improper judgment is often subjective. Proper judgment is always, always, always scriptural. Improper judgment is often subjective. Proper judgment is always scriptural. It is amazing to me how often people, particularly in the church, will elevate their personal preferences and their personal opinions to the level of absolute truth. I remember years and years ago... A, uh, an elderly lady approaching me at the back door of the church, her finger was already wagging before she got to me. Before she got within vocal range, her finger was already going. And when she got within vocal range, she unleashed her rebuke, and her rebuke was this, preachers shouldn't have beards. My first thought was funny. All those flannel graphs they showed me in Sunday school Jesus had one, the apostles had them, the patriarchs had them, the prophets had them. And we know for a fact from the Bible that Jesus had a beer because Isaiah says they ripped it from his face when they were beating him. But here's the deal. At the moment she said that, I believe the Lord gave me a flash of supernatural insight and immediately I knew exactly where she was coming from. This was a lady who had lived through the 60s. She had lived through the hippie era. She had lived through the long hair and the beards and the drug use and the sexual immorality. And in her mind, beards were a sign of rebellion. But I wasn't wearing a beard to be rebellious. And there's not one word anywhere in the Bible that would preclude the preacher or anybody else from having one. What about the pastor I knew who got in trouble with his church and ultimately lost the church because he bought... A Toyota automobile instead of an American-made car. Now, granted, he probably could have weathered the storm, and he probably would not have lost the church had he not pointed out publicly that his Toyota was made in Elizabethtown, Kentucky, and the Ford pickup trucks of his accusers were made in Matamoros, Mexico. But where exactly in the Bible does it address what kind of car you should drive? Is there some passage that proclaims, Thou shalt not purchase thy donkey from Egypt, nor thy camel from Assyria, but thy beast of burden must be of thy home country. If there is, I've never found it. And then there was the pastor I knew who weathered a storm 
because his son, his adult son, his college graduate son, his son who was living on his own, working a job, his son showed up for church one Sunday wearing an earring. You would have thought he had committed apostasy. Can I just say something to you about earrings? I'm personally not a big fan of earrings on men, okay? Can I just admit that personally? That is personal. It's just me. Okay, not the Bible, just me. I'm personally not a big fan of earrings on men, but you know what? There's not one word in the Bible that I can find that says anything about earrings on men. The only passage of the Bible that I find that says anything about earrings on men is that they took off their earrings to make the golden calf. But listen, the, the Lord didn't have any problem with them until they took them off and melted them down and made an idol out of them. And so you'll never hear me up here pontificating on men shouldn't have earrings because I can't find any Bible passage to back that up. Now those are kind of silly and extreme examples, but they illustrate the point. Anytime we find ourselves judging someone or something negatively, we need to ask ourselves if our judgment is based on the Word of God or merely on our personal preferences, opinions, or prejudices. If our judgment is based on personal opinion, then we are guilty of violating Matthew 7, 1. If our judgment is based on God's word, then we are fulfilling John 7, 24's command to judge with righteous judgment. Therefore, it is not wrong to say that stealing is sin. It is not wrong to say that murder is sin. It is not wrong to say that adultery is sin. It is not wrong to say that fornication is sin. It is not wrong to say that homosexuality is sin. It is not wrong to say that gossip is sin or any number of hundreds of other things that the Bible addresses because we're not making that judgment. The righteous judge, the one who has all authority to judge, has rendered his verdict. And all we're doing is agreeing with that verdict, not rendering one of our own. Proper judgment is always scriptural. Improper judgment is often subjective. Secondly, improper judgment is merciless to the sinner. Proper judgment is merciful to the sinner. Improper judgment comes down hard on the sinner, condemning him harshly, extending no forgiveness, attempting no restoration, and accepting no restitution. Do you remember the woman that anointed Jesus with perfume in her hair the first time? Not Mary of Bethany, but the first time. And they were in the home of Simon the Pharisee when she did that. And the Bible says of that woman that she had lived a sinful life, past tense, the implication being she was no longer living a sinful life. Jesus had rescued her from that sinful life. And she was expressing her thanksgiving to Jesus for changing her life. But do you remember what Simon the Pharisee said about her? He said, if this man were a prophet, he would know the kind of woman she is. That she is a sinful woman. See, to the Pharisees, there was no redemption. To the Pharisees, once a sinner, always a sinner. Once you had fallen in their eyes, you could never get up. You could never be restored. Proper judgment always seeks restoration for the sinning brother and salvation for a sinful world. Improper judgment stops at condemnation and goes no further. That's why those people that hold the signs at the funerals of soldiers are so deadly and so wrong. Because all they are is condemnation. There's no, no hope of salvation for them. There's no, they're, they're not offering any kind of redemption. They're just condemning. And it makes all of us look bad. Improper judgment is merciless to the sinner. Proper judgment always holds forth mercy to the sinner. Third, improper judgment deals with assumptions. Proper judgment deals with actions. The Bible teaches us that man looks on the outward appearance, but only God can see the heart. And beyond that, in any situation, we're unlikely to have all the pertinent information to make an accurate judgment. But that doesn't stop us, does it? How often do we look at somebody and, and look at their situation and look at what they're doing and, 
and we make all kinds of assumptions about their hearts, all kinds of assumptions about their thinking, all kinds of assumptions about their motives based on the way things look to us. I think I've read you this story before, but it bears repeating. Chuck Swindoll in his book, The Grace Awakening, tells a story that illustrates this point perfectly, and I could never tell it as well as he writes it, so I'm just going to read it to you. He says, I will never forget what happened to me several years ago that illustrated how wrong I could be in judging another. I was speaking at a summer Bible conference for a week. Attending the same conference was a couple I had not seen before. We met briefly the first night. Both were friendly and seemed especially glad to be there. I began to notice as the week wore on that the man fell asleep in every one of the meetings. I mean every one. Normally that doesn't bother me. I often talk in other people's sleep. But this time, for some strange reason, it began to bug me. By Wednesday, I felt feelings of irritation. As I mentioned, that has happened to me numerous times, but this guy was out within 10 minutes after I started to speak. It made no difference if I spoke in the morning or in the evening. He slept. By the last meeting on Friday evening, through which he slept, of course, I had become convinced that it was she who wanted to be there, not her husband. I sized him up as a fellow who walked, talked one way and lived another, probably a carnal Christian, I mused. She stayed behind after the crowd and her husband had left. She asked if she could speak with me for a few minutes. I figured she wanted to talk about how unhappy she was living with a man who didn't have the same interest in spiritual things as she. How wrong I was. She said their being there was his idea. It had been his final wish. I didn't understand. She informed me that he had terminal cancer and had only weeks to live. At his request, they attended the conference where I was speaking, even though the medication he was taking for pain made him sleepy, something which greatly embarrassed him. He loves the Lord, she said, and you are his favorite Bible teacher. He wanted to be here to meet you and to hear you no matter what. I was sincerely stunned. She thanked me for the week and left. I stood there all alone, as deeply rebuked as I have ever been. I had judged my brother, and I was as wrong as I could possibly have been. How many times have we judged based on what we thought? How many times have we judged based on how it appeared to us We've judged somebody's motives, we've judged somebody's heart, and we were as wrong as we could have possibly been. Improper judgment deals with assumptions. Proper judgment deals with actions. Fourth, improper judgment focuses on others. Proper judgment starts with oneself. It is amazing, isn't it, how clearly we can see the sin in others while being blind to the sin in ourselves. And Jesus illustrated that tendency with a rather humorous illustration about somebody trying to help their brother get a speck of sawdust out of their eye while a big log is hanging out of their own eye. He says, you hypocrite, take the log out of your own eye, then you can see clearly to help your brother with the speck of sawdust that's in his own he says, before we try to straighten everybody else out, we need to deal with our own issues first. Now that having been said, I think I need to say something about the oft-repeated argument that implies that unless Christians are perfect, they can't say anything about anyone else's sins. How silly. None of us is perfect. I discerned and continue to discern my own sins on the basis of the Word of God, and that drove me to Christ for forgiveness. I discern the sins of others by that same standard. I think it should also be, I should also say something about the oft-repeated statement that all sins are equal. That's simply not so. All sins are equally sin, and any sin is enough to con condemn us. But all sins are certainly not equal, and the Bible certainly does not teach that. All sins are not equal any more than a log and a speck are equal. Jesus told Pilate that his condemnation of him was sin. But he said, those who handed me over to you are guilty of greater sin. 
He said elsewhere that the city, talking about the cities that had rejected him, he said it will be better for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for you. I think most of us, if we think, of, think it through, we realize that that whole statement that all sins are equal is silly. Nobody really believes that. Gossip is sin, but nobody would put it on the same level as murder. It certainly does not have the same impact in terms of the sinner, the sinned against, or society. Now, granted, I've wanted to kill a few gossips in my time. But in my clearer thinking moments, I realize that gossip and murder are not on the same level. Improper judgment focuses on others. Proper judgment starts with oneself. And along those same lines, improper judgment seeks only to be hurtful. Proper judgment seeks only to be helpful. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, ignore the speck in your brother's eye. He says, deal with your log first and then help your brother. It is appropriate to help your brother with the speck in his eye. And listen, helping your brother get that speck out of his eye may hurt. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is not the hurt. It's not to inflict pain. The purpose is to bring healing to the eye. Proper judgment seeks that healing, not just to be hurtful. Sixth, improper judgment gloats over sin. Proper judgment grieves over sin. Those who judge improperly are secretly happy when somebody else messes up because then they feel morally superior. Those who judge appropriately are grieved over sin and the damage that sin has done to the sinner and to others. If you want a good contrast of that picture, Ham, Noah's son, finding his father drunk and passed out naked in his tent, and he couldn't wait to run and go tell his brothers gleefully, Guys, you got to see this dad's drunk and passed out in the tent. Compare that to Samuel staying up all night and groaning and weeping in prayer over Saul's failures as king. And you can see the contrast between the two. Improper judgment gloats over someone else's sin. Proper judgment grieves over someone else's sin. And that brings us to the last contrast. Improper judgment is most interested in conversing with others. Proper judgment is most interested in correcting the offender. Gossip never proceeds from a right heart. If our hearts are right, we'll go to the person who has sinned or offended us and speak to him privately in an effort to gently correct him. If our hearts are wrong, we can't wait to tell everybody what they did. If our hearts are wrong, we can't wait to publicly denounce them and condemn them and tell everybody what they did. If our hearts are right, we point out that certain things are sin, not out of anger and not out of cruelty, but out of our desire for those involved in those sins to see their sin, to be convicted by the Holy Spirit, and to be saved. So we've talked today about judgment. Appropriate judgment and inappropriate judgment. But I would say to you this morning that as painful as human judgment can be, there is a much more important and much more severe matter of judgment that all of us should pay attention to. One day every human being is going to stand before the sovereign Lord of the universe the righteous judge, the one who knows the whole story, the one who has all the facts, the one who will always judge with righteous judgment.